Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Diana. I thought we were having a thing there, but we're okay. It's great to see you on this Friday, right on the bridge to the weekend. You made it. Now you're right there at the threshold. What are you going to do with your one precious weekend this weekend? I hope it's something great. I'm so excited for tonight's show. Um, we are doing something a little different tonight, and I hope you're as excited as I am. I think there's quite a few new people who are tuning in. There's so many people in our rug hooking group, right, that we kind of started on the Facebook page. We're still there, rug hooking and Esper Sand Punch Needle Club. Um, but there are so many of us in this group that do things besides hook rugs or punch rugs. There are so many textile artists of all kinds who love talking about fiber, talking about rugs and textiles and all things fabric and wool especially. So tonight episode, tonight's episode is really going to hit you right in your sweet spot. Tonight we are looking at not orange juice, although it's great. I'm not feeling very, very well tonight, so I'm doing orange juice tonight. Cheers, my dears, to all of you with your lovely cocktails. That'll be me next week. Uh, tonight we are looking at this cl modern classic by Melinda Purcell Bird. Uh, I've been saying it wrong all week. It's Rhea Rugs. So let's let's help me out with that. I'm going to try to say it the right way tonight. Looking at Rhea Rugs, which is a completely different form of rug making. Throughout the episode tonight, let's look at some amazing examples from Melinda. Melinda is on with us tonight. There you are. Melinda, I was hoping you weren't going to have trouble signing on. Sometimes that's a thing. You are so welcome to the show. It is great to see you. Tonight, I'm doing a lot of commentary, a lot of slides, talking about the Rhea Rug, talking about Melinda, her family story, which is just so beautiful, uh, and all of the questions about Rhea Rugs, because I have yet to make one. I am still at the just discovering and admiring stage. I am deferring all questions to Melinda um, that have to do specifically with Rhea Rugs. Not to put too much on you, no pressure there, right? Um, but you are the expert, and certainly Melinda is the person who, in our lifetimes, is re uh, is reviving, you know, single-handedly this massive, um, lost uh, form of rug making, that you know, not completely lost, right? Because it's it's in your family and it's in you and it's it's there now. Um, but all of our rug making forms, and as with so many other early American um, trades and hobbies and pursuits, pastimes are lost or teetering on lost. So it's so important on nights like this to talk about some of the ones that we don't know, share our information, um, look at what they look like. It's going to be a great night. It's going to be a lot of fun. Donna, it is great to see you. Oh, you're <laughs> you're sweating in your moo moo. I've got something very similar on, I have to say. I mean, I, I, I'm looking like Maud. Do you remember that show, Here Comes Maud with B. Arthur? Uh, in a huge way, but it's warm here too. Becky, it's great to see you. Good evening, Melinda. I'm so happy that you're here. It is an honor to have you. So everybody just know, and I'll remind you through the episode as people log on, that in that thread, no matter what I'm saying, if you want to ask Melinda a question, make sure that you do. It's not distracting for me at all. I catch up when I can. This is a great opportunity for you to speak to her directly. So make sure that you do that. Linda, it's great to see you. And Karen, Ryan, great to see you. Yeah, I was having technical difficulties. This program keeps changing right before my eyes. Catherine and Doreen, great to see you. Robin, oh, I'm just checking in with everybody here. Barbara, great to see you. You know, it's funny, two Ryans, both buddies. Great to see you, TGIF. You know what, why don't I just open the orange juice? It's such a lackluster drink, but I don't want to push it when I'm not feeling super well. Cheers, my dears. Wendy, cheers, my dears. It's great to see you. Linda, Ann, Lisa, all the buddies are on. Uh, Juliet, good to see you. And April, Kirsten, lots of buddies on tonight. I'm going to try to keep an eye on the thread as we go. There's so much content to cover that I'm going to go at a bit of a breakneck speed, but make sure that you are busy in that sideline because it is a gift to be able to have somebody like Melinda here, author of this book, um, you know, to be able to help us walk through this because if you remember from coffee time this past week, we were doing one of our episodes where we were looking at rugs that were currently available on the different auction sites and platforms online, right? All the different places that one might buy a hook drug. And I came across a rug that was a quite lovely Lachuk rug, except it wasn't. It was a Rhea rug. And that kind of brought us down the rabbit hole. And I came back to it because it seems like a lot of people were interested, two Ryans who both punch. I know, isn't that funny? 
Isn't that great? Um, it took us down the rabbit hole because it seemed like so many people were interesting to interested in what Rhea was and didn't know. So I kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit and then in the last couple of days a lot more. So we are here tonight to do an <laughs> Ryan's for Raya. Oh, that's a banner. That's a banner and a half. We can all do the wave to that one, right? Oh, Lynn, you're dying your first batch of wool there. That is exciting. Juliet, I always am at breakneck speed. I get so tired of being at break. That's probably why I get sick so much that I'm drinking my orange juice. But I'm so excited about tonight's show. I did not want to fool with any part of it. I've got several different things happening. And I think I'm going to start. I'm changing the order of the show. Um, I think I'm going to start with Melinda because we know that she's here. We know that you can, you can access her with questions and um, thoughts and ideas right there in the thread as we go along. Um, so I think I'm going to start by, I'm going to do a little intro, and then I'm going to start by looking at um, Melinda's book. I took some pictures while I was at the beach with the kids yesterday, and we can look at how that book is broken down and what information is, is in it, right? It is like a really um, thorough, informative, like the Bible of Raya Rugs. I'm sorry, Rhea Rugs. It's going to happen, right? Um, a nice long book. It is absolutely beautiful. The link to both this book, this book, the link to the book is in the thread for this video. The link to Melinda's uh, website um, also in this video. You can click on the link. Um, and I think maybe I did the Etsy shop too. There's a blog on the main site. Melinda, you can remind people there in the thread all the different places that they can find you and reach you, including in Maryland, uh, by going in and choosing some wools. But the thing that really got me going, um, as I got some traction uh, getting into this book, the thing that got me going is the story, behind Melinda's story, right? It's a family story, it's a personal story. And I wanna share that part of it first, because you know how I love these sort of um, heart connections when we have these cozy Friday night episodes. I love thinking about the story behind the story and you wonder how these things began, those kinds of thoughts. And the story here, uh, Melinda's grandparents, you know, starting this Rhea rug business is, I think, my favorite story so far. And I got all, all crazy and emotional at the beach yesterday. You'll know when, you'll know when, when I get to that part in the story. So, you know, we're going to get into the history and things as time goes on in this episode. I've got several different parts to it laid out for us. But I want to start by looking at this book because it truly is a marvel. Now, I'm just going to say briefly, you know, if you're wondering, sort of overarching thoughts, if you're wondering, is Rhea the same as Latch Hook? That's a huge no. So I was very lucky, and Melinda, thank you so much for spending some time on the phone with me yesterday. Um, I was very lucky to get some clarity. I mean, I know that it's not Latch Hook, but it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong or if I'm misstating anything, it seems to me we've done so many episodes of Coffee Time and Cocktails Time where we talk about different trends in rug hooking and rug making. And we know that looking at the earlier 20th century, uh, there was a huge pend pendulum swing toward handcrafts. And they were esteemed. And with the sort of colonial movement in the US, people getting back to those ideas of early American crafts, uh, all of that, handcrafts became revered again. And moving toward the middle of the, after the war years, not so much, right? Everybody got, came home and moved to the suburbs and got very busy with their lives and their stuff. Uh, and it was a great luxury after those hard years to be able to buy stuff. And so people did. But then the pendulum swung again when we got into the middle of the century with that MCM, mid-century modern movement. Because people, again, the pendulum is bound to swing, started thinking about things that were handmade and thinking, they're better, aren't they? They're just better. They're more special. They have more lore. Um, and that included rugs and textiles. So during that period, that's when we're talking about the introduction of the rear rug. And the rear rug is made on a fabric backing, right, that is unique. It is not the backing that we use for hooking. It's not monk's cloth. It's not linen. Um, it looks similar, right, but it has kind of a charted look to it with rows coming down where it's very clear where you're making your knots. And with this craft, and Melinda, tell me if I'm wrong, it looks like you're making knots with a needle. So the needle is, is um, going through creating a specific stitch, the Rhea, I guess, stitch. Uh, and Rhea is also a, a sheep, a breed of sheep in Scandinavia, right? We saw that on, I guess, Wednesday or Thursday in 
coffee time. Um, in any case, uh, very different materials than rug hooking, right? Except the wool is the same and you're using a fabric backing and no frame. Whereas with latch hook, you are using a very stiff frame with wide open window panes, very different, not the same at all. With latch hook, you're using pre-cut pieces and you're using a hook with a toggle to bring them through and they knot themselves with this ingenious toggle as you go. So I just want to complete this thought before I forget. Dave, great to see you. Catherine, great to see you. So um, <laughs> Melinda, no, they're not the same. So there comes a time in the history, the story of the rear rugs where the pendulum swings again and not in a good way. So while rear rugs are very popular because of Melinda's grandparents, right? She, they, I'm gonna tell you the story of how they brought or the rear rugs came to the US from Scandinavia. Right after their popularity, there comes that time, we hit the sort of 1970s and everybody is about, pendulum is swung, everybody's about buying stuff and commercial stuff and kits. And this also happens to be something else we've talked about quite a bit. This also happens to be that time when there's a lot of big sort of pig conglomerate type umbrella companies buying up much smaller companies, um, smaller yarn stores, thread stores, craft stores, all, you know, buying up hundreds or one or 200 in a year under one giant umbrella. And at that point, things change because those big monsters, um, not to say that they're all bad, right, but they have all the money and they have all the power at this point, um, started to make latch hook kits. It, different craft, but we're still talking about a rug that has a very high pile. So a lot of people, I think, saw those because they were readily available, started to go for that, and then there becomes confusion about what the difference is between a rear rug and a latch rug. They are completely different, and they're also completely different in their supplies. Because I think, you know that I love all forms of rug making, but I think one of the things that in, in contemporary times, right now, um, a lot of rug makers don't like about latch hook is that they don't like its association with um, sort of man-made materials, right? So not the organic materials, not that luscious wool. While there's a large camp of people who are thinking, if I'm going to make a rug and I'm going to spend that money and that time, I am going to want that textile feel of that wool in my hands, that glossy sheen. That's part of the experience and I, and I can't do without that. So you can see how these two things sort of bumping, headbutting each other at this moment in history um, would not end well. So for many, many years, I'm giving the overarching story and we're gonna go in in detail. For many, many years, nobody thought about or was hooking rear rugs in this country. And luckily, and I'm not gonna spoil that part, Melinda, don't worry, that's like the best part of this story. That changes. Let me catch up on, um, oh, mom, there you are, good to see you. It's easy to lose, lose track of time. Melinda says, yes, you make the knots with the needle and a few long strands of the knots of the needle for, uh, for lots of color possibilities. Melinda, let me ask you, when you're making those knots with your needle into the backing, do you work directly from a cake of yarn or are you pre-cutting long pieces? That's what I'm wondering. Um, Lynn says, I've seen it uh, where it was done on that special fabric with a needle and also on a loom where you have the strings up and down and then you hand tie every other one. Interesting. Uh, Melinda says, my grandparents and a half dozen other Raya promoters sold in the U.S. in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And Brenda says, so interesting to be learning this. Yes. And Karen says, Melinda, can you use pre-cut wool pieces? I have spinner in pre-cut wool pieces. I know that, uh, that it's quicker with long pieces. Lynn says, Melinda Bird, I am in awe of this craft in the history. I am too. So I'm gonna let Melinda ask those kinds of questions because it seems to me like it, it would defeat the purpose. Um, just watching the way it's done, it looks like some people are stitching over what looks like a giant popsicle stick that can come in different sizes, meaning different heights, widths, right? Not this way, but this way. Um, it's some people are going over those. Same idea as back in the day for rug hookers, when people were trying to, in the 19th and early 20th century, create rugs that had a very even pile, right? This is before Pearl McGowan certifications. People wanted a nice even pile, and they sometimes would insert 
a little stick that would look like a chopstick. They were made for this purpose. You could get these sticks, I forget what they're called, but you would literally hook over them and then pull it out. And that would be how you knew that you were at the right height. Very labor intensive and adding another layer of work for a hook drug. Now with a rear rug, you have the thing laying down and you're putting many stitches over it at once. But Melinda, it also looked like you don't have to use that particular device. Maybe it's one of those things where some people favor it and other people are like, I don't, I don't use that. Certainly things to think about as we talk about rear rugs and walk into this conversation, the ways that they're different from our comfort zone, hook drugs, right, for most of us, um, you, are, you, you are not using a frame. So whether you do or don't use a frame, you know, as a rug hooker, you're not using a frame with rear rugs. That's different. You're using a needle instead of a hook. That's different. So there's going to be some things that are uh, very different, but I think also very favorable. Uh, don't forget to like and share. Thank you, Jay. That is always good to like, share, comment, all those things to keep the channel visible. Um, let me see. I want to catch up with where we are. Uh, Melinda says, the big skein is open into a big loop, and the loop is cut once, uh, which makes all the strands about um, four inches long. Your thread and needle, you thread the needle with these strands. Okay. Oh, that's right. I saw that on your page. Um, you s called it a ponytail or something like that with a knot on top and all the colors coming down. Would that be one of the strands? And I also noticed uh, in looking at the book, the how-to part, we're not going to get hugely into the how-to tonight because we can always return to this subject, right? It's a vast subject and it's worth exploring. Um, but I'm curious because one of the things that I like about Rhea, besides the two things that I mentioned as a person who hasn't done one yet, is the color variations that you get. So we're going to be seeing a lot of this tonight. But if you just look at the color of the book, and I do have a slideshow ready for you, there's a lot of color changing action happening. Like even in areas that look like they're orange, there's other colors, lights and darks mixed in. And I guess maybe that's the idea of that ponytail that you have your strands and maybe some of them are orange, but maybe some of them are not. Maybe some are tan or yellow or whatever. Uh, and then when you are knotting them, you pull up these knots that have some color variation. So for us as rug hookers, this can be one of the trickiest things to achieve a very um, busy, varied look in, in, in areas that you're filling, right? Because you're either filling with solid wool, strips or yarn, or something variegated like yarn or wool that's been dyed, spotted, mottled, something like that to get a variety. Whereas with this method, you're stringing your needle, you're threading your needle, and you're putting the colors that you chose for those knots into that pull, right? You're going to be threading them through the needle and those are going to be the ones you're working. And you make that decision from what it looks like as to what colors are going in that area. So for me, that's very different because that's a great, wide, uh, great way to DIY to control what colors you're going to be changing with. And if you're, for example, doing some kind of a hazy glow effect, you want more lights, maybe you start putting a couple of extra lighter uh, yarns into that needle, right? And then your color will slowly change and look more diffused. We're going to see examples of this. The ponytail, Melinda said, is a good designing tool. It helps you see different colors together that you might or not might or might not have imagined putting together. I think that's a great idea. Never use the ruler, okay, four feet, not four inches, okay. I'm just following the conversation here. Just gave me a thought. Now I lost it. Um, you know, interesting, this feeds into our conversations lately about the color wheel, right? Because sometimes when you're planning out your colors, you know you want a little bit more interest than just solids. And you're thinking, well, what other colors should I introduce? Well, looking at rear rugs, and we've got lots of examples tonight and on the internet, of course, um, you can see that there are so many ways to tackle this color thing. And for, we're not going to have a color conversation tonight because we often do and we'll save a big color conversation for another day. But it's interesting to think about, do I want colors to really pop and fight against each other for high drama and contrast? Then you're looking at contrasting colors, complementary colors, opposites on the color wheel. Or am I going to Monet it? Do I want all my blues mixed in with my lilacs and lavenders? Those are analogous colors that are immediately next to each other on the color wheel. Interesting things to think about when you're putting your ponytail together, right? So let's look at some rear rugs, but let's first start with the story of Melinda. And I, I'm working directly from the book, and I have a slideshow for you, so this should be popping up. 
Um, Melinda, I took some pictures from the book of you. Uh, it's always nice to know who you're talking about. You are just such a beautiful woman, too. It really adds adds to things. It's like, wow, look at her. She's out there in the snow with her Carhartt jacket on and this beautiful rear rug, and you're cleaning it in the snow, which is something that we do as rug hookers, too. It's a nice kind of um, not over-the-top, not super invasive way of, of cleaning a wool textile. And this, so here we come. I'm going to follow along with you um, for a minute because I'm going to come back to you for just a minute. I'm going to show you that article. I opened the book and I'm looking at some great pictures of Melinda teaching, things like this, right? Makes you want to get in the car and shoot down to Maryland, um, get into that studio with all of those yarns and have some good times, right? I think that's the piece on the cover of the book, which is just beautiful. Um, Melinda, I'm going to throw a question to you that you can answer maybe in the thread um, while I'm running commentary. Do you think that the reason there are so many uh, Rhea designs that lean toward geometrics and abstracts is because of the high shag, meaning pixelation? Or do you think that it's because these rugs have historically been so popular during the mid-century modern movement uh, when m only geometrics and abstracts were very popular. I just wonder what your opinion is. And it doesn't matter, does it? It's just interesting to kind of put bookends around that thought for me. This lovely book opens up with a foreword. Um, and, and Melinda tells the story in the foreword about meeting, uh, well, the person who does the foreword is a photojournalist called Ken Coons. And um, he writes the foreword in 2019 about a time when he went to visit Melinda on a different subject. Uh, he was doing a different, a different um, sort of conservation project and, and he wanted to include Melinda on some film. And um, Melinda is a conservationist by, by trade and, and um, that's what she's done. And now we're, you're heading more toward Rhea, right? I'll let you tell that part of it. But um, Ken went to, to Melinda and they got into a conversation that sort of evolved, um, talking about, as you do, uh, related things and different things and passions and interests and hobbies. And it came to uh, what we were saying at the beginning of the episode, beautiful old time pastimes that are almost extinct, right? That have fallen by the wayside in a criminal way. So it, I mean, that is a joke, right? So that made Melinda think about her grandparents and the Rhea rugs. And she started to tell Ken about them. And Ken said, why don't I come back and I wanna do this video series about these old craft traditions that are fading fast. And I want to film you working on your Rhea rug, right? This is gonna be one of those moments, one of these Robert Frost moments when the roads divide, right? And, and your life follows this path instead of that one. Uh, one of these great moments in life. So. Uh, it's funny how um, Melinda talks about it and how Ken talks about it. This was a really big deal at the time because Ken records this video, which I do have the link to. It's on YouTube in the video for tonight that you're watching. It looks like this when you open it up. Handcrafted Traditions by Ken Coons. It's a beautiful video. It's a beautiful, very uh, atmospheric video. Very, lots of romance. Lot You feel like you really know the subject of rear rugs when you watch it. It's just lovely. And uh, evocative. But in recording this video, um, it was surprising how many people watched it and became super interested in the Rhea rugs. So let's move then to the preface where we're hearing not Ken's story, but Melinda's story. And I just want to do some of the backstory. So I'm, I'm reading directly from some of it and I'm doing some paraphrasing. And again, I am looking at this book called Rhea rugs by Melinda Purcell Bird. Uh, and she's on with us tonight if you're just joining us. So um, kind of diving into the uh, preface, Melinda says, my grandparents, Angie and Bill Lundgren of Northborough, Massachusetts, established their cottage, cottage business of Lundgren Rhea Incorporated, 1955, the year that I was born. I designed my first Rhea, a pillow, when I was in sixth grade. After college, I spent nearly five years working at my grandparents' sides, learning the art of designing, teaching, calculating yarn requirements, and shipping supplies off to waiting Rhea crafts folks around the country. In 1982, I moved from Massachusetts to Maryland. My mother continued the Rhea business with my grandparents, but within a few years, my grandparents passed on and the Rhea business was sold. Decades passed 
it seemed that all the thriving RIA enterprises of the 50s through the 70s had vanished off the face of the earth. In 1910, I was approached by Ken Coons, the photojournalist for my local newspaper, the Carroll County Times. He was creating a series of handcraft tradition videos. Um, and Melinda says, I'm, I'm skipping down a little bit. She was, at, she was thinking, should I even do this, right? Should I, is this even a good idea to revisit this at this point of life, right? Because she's saying, what's the point of getting people excited about a dying art when the crucial materials are no longer available? And that is a huge speed bump, isn't it, when you think about it? But she says, uh, she went ahead and did it. They recorded this video. In May 2011, we posted on YouTube the video documenting the design and nodding of what I thought would be my last, that almost chokes me up, my last Raya rug. I'm very glad that it wasn't. Um, and again, this link to this exact video is in the video for tonight. So when we log off later, you can log right on there and watch that. In October 2013, so when this happened, and it was obvious that there were many bites, many people interested in Rhea, Melinda says to herself, what about that stuff that we sold years ago, right? It's still in storage. Um, so, she, you know, wouldn't you, in Melinda's uh, shoes, become, I would, I would become horribly obsessed and crazy thinking about that stuff in storage, um, not in a normal way, in an unhealthy way her grandmother's her grandparents stuff so she ended up in October of 2013 she made an offer to the woman who had all the Lundgren su supplies the family supplies and designs in storage and bought back Lundgren Raya I mean that is such a thing isn't it I am now purchasing additional Raya supplies from Norway Sweden and Finland through connections I've made in the once hidden world of, of Raya as you can imagine before the internet um, getting in touch with people in Scandinavia who made this unique backing. Good, oh, enjoy. Good to see you. Good evening. And Whitney, good evening from your campground. Good to see you. You can imagine without the aid of the internet and translations and Google, Babel, Fish, and all of that stuff, how difficult it would be to pinpoint companies that might make this background, this backing for RIA, and contact them, right, to be able to communicate and make a deal. I mean, it's, it sounds extremely tricky. We're coming back to that great story, but we move into, in the book, the introduction. And I just want to tell you what the sections of the book are, because I know that you'll want the book. Um, and it's good to know what, you're, what you have to look forward to, because while this is a great how-to book, this is a great inspiration book. And it's one of these super rare and fun books that you not only can learn from, but you can keep it on your bedside table. And that really is the best of both worlds, isn't it? So in the introduction, she says, what is Rhea? And then defines it in several ways. It is a rare sheep breed in Sweden. It is a nodding technique. It is a shaggy rug or coverlet. It is the origin of the English word rug derived from the Nordic tradition. It is a traditional Nordic craft that you can learn today. That's funny because I'm thinking in Dutch, it's like, like Ruha, and that is close to Raya or Ria. I'm wondering if those are if those are linked. So the introduction is full of information and just more beautiful backstory. Um, I didn't put this one in the slideshow, but this beautiful sheep. I showed a dark one last week, a dark Ria sheep in the Coffee Time episode, and Melinda wrote the beautiful face and fleece of this heritage breed sheep in Sweden, called the Ria Far was nearly extinct in the mid 20th century. They are now carefully managed as a conservation breed on small farms in Sweden. Um, so beautiful backstory. And then we get into the family story. This is my favorite part. Let me recross my legs and get something, get one more swig. Cheers, my dears, to all of you who are logging on now. Oh, Melinda answered the question about geometrics. Good question about the geometrics, mostly due to the mid-century modern designs. Now, anything is possible. That's really good to know. Um, Ken's family did the music in that video. Uh, they are uh, Whirligig, different spelling of Whirligig, I guess, with an E. It was beautiful. That music was, um, you know, you felt like it, it was centuries ago, right? You felt, it felt like it was centuries ago, and you were hearing instruments that you don't hear at all anymore that all sounded... Um, both curious and relaxing. It's a beautiful video. 
Um, so Julie had asked, how can you tell if it's a vintage Rhea or a newer one? Are there differences in the backing or cloth? We're going to look at some of those later, but I'll let Melinda hit that one too because she probably has a much more sort of universal gauge than I do just looking at them as a newcomer. Corrine says, I first discovered the Rhea Rug Revival from watching that video. Isn't that fantastic? Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Those words are links. That's interesting, isn't it? Not surprising. Dutch is not close to any of the Scandinavian languages, but some words, as always happens, right, are... Um, well, Dutch is Germanic, and I wonder if Scandinavian languages are also Germanic languages. I wonder. So the next part of the book, chapter one, goes into the Lundgren story. And this is so beautiful. I'm going to do some reading from here. I'm only reading part of it so that when you receive this book and you are tucked up in bed, there's lots more for you to read and enjoy. So Melinda writes, in 1955, my Swedish grandfather, William Lundgren, inv invited a visiting business associate, associate from Sweden to join with him and my grandmother, Angelina, for Thanksgiving dinner. They became close friends during the Swedes' stay in Massachusetts. After returning home to Sweden, the visitor sent my grandparents a Rhea rug kit from his company, Berga, B-E-R-G-A, to thank them for their kindness. The kit included a hardy woven wool backing, skeins of virgin wool Rhea, yarn, needles, and graft, uh, a graft design. Um, can you imagine getting a gift like that in the mail? How exciting that would be. It would be like something from another planet, right? In those days, like all this, it looks familiar, but it's not stuff you've seen before at all. I mean, wouldn't that be fantastic? Um, uh, Rhea rug making had entered the scene in the United States almost 10 years earlier, mostly in New York City. As a human interest story, however, the story of my grandparents' venture soon got national television coverage featuring this elderly couple who started a cottage industry importing Swedish rug making supplies. As the family legend has it, within days of the broadcast, the mail carrier had to deliver the Lundgren mail in sacks. It's like Santa Claus story, isn't it? Um, to keep up with the demand, my grandparents hired their next door neighbor and friend, Mary Cullen, to help run the business on a daily basis. And then, uh, Melinda, Melinda, you tell this adorable story that I think everyone will appreciate, a nice anecdote like this. As I, grew, as I grew up, every visit to my grandparents' house included playtime in the yarn room with my brothers and sisters. My favorite game was how fast can you return a skein to its proper storage cubicle? That sounds like, like a cleanup game in our house, but it, it actually was fun. She said, I'd wait in the doorway while my brother John would be in the yarn room searching for the most challenging color skein to hand me. As fast as I could, I'd dash into the yarn room and put it among like colors in the correct order. Then I'd pick a color for my brother. It's almost like you were using the Dewey Decimal System or something like that, isn't it? Because the there's such um, the shades within shades within shades, right? It's not like it goes with the pinks. There's probably a ton of different pinks, uh, making it a very challenging um, exercise. So let me come back to the slideshow. Um, oh, Melinda says, um, oh, I, li I like that language breakdown. That's helpful. That's definitely helpful. Melissa says, Rhea kits today are almost identical to the kit my grandparents received. Isn't that romantic? It really is, isn't it? I love this stuff, especially on Friday nights. I love this stuff. I stopped at this page because I, I was at the beach, right? It was, it was jellyfish week this week, and we didn't know it, so we couldn't go in the water. I, I went in, and I got bit, and it was fine, but, it, you know, it hurt. <laughs> so I was sitting in the shade of the of the lifeguard stand reading this and I was getting all uh, emotional because it was so beautiful this part of it so this is a this is a clipping of course from a paper the Boston Globe women Saturday a section called women Saturday September 7th 1968 um, and in this you see I'll come back to you while I read but um, Mrs. Angelina Lundgren so that is Melinda's grandmother on the left and also on the right standing in a room with all those beautiful rugs. I'll leave it there for a minute so you can admire it. Um, this article is called, She Sparked the Rage for Rhea Rug Making by Ellen Goodman. And it reads, in the Middle Ages, the Viking sailors brought the art of Rhea rug making from Persia to Sweden. In the 20th century, Mrs. Angelina Lundgren brought it from Sweden to America. The 75 year old white haired grandmother of seven um, seven, oh, I see, you can see how it folds, it's hard to read. Um, s of seven, 
almost single-handedly responsible for the craze of knotting rear rugs, a handcraft that in um, flooring that in, that is flooring Americans. You know what? Let me switch my glasses. One one quick second. I need my stronger ones because you can see this is a tiny article. I'm going to come back to you here. You know what? Those don't help. Let's try. Let's try door number three. I'm telling you, it's my eyes. Yeah, that's it. My eyes are going downhill fast. Um, from her Northborough home, behind a red barn turned nursery school, she prepares and ships rug kits, running a booming mail order business that developed out of a house, a house gift 12 years ago. That was the gift from the Swede, right, who stayed for Thanksgiving dinner. In 1956, a young textile engineer from Sweden touring the United States stayed with the Lundgrens, and they say over the Christmas holidays, but we know that it was Thanksgiving as a guest of Mr. Lundgren, who is a retired textile research engineer. And this is a quote. After he returned, this is from the grandmother Angelina. After he returned to Sweden, he sent me a Rhea rug kit, remembers Mrs. Lundgren. She made the rug in a few weeks and was fascinated by the technique. So were all my friends and neighbors. They all wanted to know where they could send, send for one of these kits, she says. It turned out that the father at at her house guest, the father of her house guest owned a mill and held shares in the company that supplies <clears throat> the materials for the kits. When she visited Sweden the following year, she was asked to represent the company in America. What a thing, right? What a thing. So at 63, she went into a new business. In 1956, I held a formal exhibit in our home. I'm going to skip that part, although it's interesting. Now she has thousands of customer client friends all over the country who make, uh, who make kits and create their own designs with her materials. Sitting in a wing chair in her living room, Mrs. Lundgren shuffled through dozens of letters from her regulars. And she says this, here's one from a woman who loved her rug so much uh, that she used it, she used to leave it on the floor unfinished while she was still working on it. Oh, and here's one from a psychiatrist in Washington who, who made 54 rugs and exchanged them for paintings. She looked up, fiddling with her eyeglasses and said, wouldn't you be excited if you got all these letters? She sounds like such a little firefly, Melinda. She sounds just adorable. At her feet were three of the dozen or more Raya rugs that decorate her own house. Let me bring you back to that photo because that will fit. That decorate her own house. That one, said Mrs. Lundgren, pointing pointing at a handsome green and blue geometric design, was in our booth at Winterfest. 10,000 people walked on it. After the show, it was a mess, chuckled her husband. But we took it out and dumped it upside down uh, in the snow and beat it clean. There was absolutely no dirt left. Originally in Scandinavia, and this is a little bit of history from this article, I'll come back to you here. Originally in Scandinavia, see this article is just chock full. I just, I couldn't get enough of it here, but I need a magnifying glass. Originally in Scandinavia, animal skins were used as rugs or blankets. And as the fur wore off, the skins were patched with tufts of sheep wool. Then by the 12th century, they, uh, they used a woven fabric backing and gradually learned to leave a space through which a needle could pull yarn, making a knot in a high loop. The designs are mapped out on graph paper, not stamped on the backing. It is, it is as easy to make your own design as it is to follow a prepared one. Original patterns are common in Sweden, where rear rug making is as popular as cruel or hooking is in Massachusetts. It's on the way, it's on the way to equal status here, thanks to Mrs. Lundgren. And at the end, this is my favorite part of the whole article. This is a quote. The peculiar thing about it is, laughs Angelina Lundgren, that I'm Italian. I thought that was so cute. That was so cute. It is a beautiful story, isn't it? It's just a beautiful story. I mean, I wish that everybody could have this kind of story in their family tree. It is so lovely. Let me bring you back here and we'll go forward. Um, so all of that, all of that nugget, a little bit of history, a little bit of interest, uh, a window into the personality of Angelina, all here. There's Melinda, a picture from the book, working on a rug. Oh, I showed you these. 
And this is, Melinda, I guess this is a painting of your grandma. Uh, what a lovely lady. I love, I love the, you know, the style of the time, right? I love the kind of stoic look and the dark colors, but then that massive pop of color around her neck. It's like, it's like she's got it contained, but it's just popping out all colorful. It's popping out all over. It was just such a perfect choice. Uh, knowing what she was passionate about, these rear rugs, to have such a colorful scarf. That's a closer up picture of that photo from the article that I was just reading to you. It's just lovely. Oh, so, oh, you know what? So let me come out of that. Let me come back to you. Spoiler alert. So I just want to finish going through um, the basic sort of uh, parts to the book. I'm looking at some of the articles because this book is in part a scrapbook too of things that have been taken that are important pieces of history that speak about rear rug making from the mid-century to now. So there, this is coming from an article called Authentic Rear Rugs Made by You. It was an advertisement that was in the paper that was put out by your grandmother and grandfather, right? Because it was put out by Lundgren Inc. Uh, and it's, it's, I'm not gonna read all of it, but I like how in the middle it says, I highlighted this part, they wrote, any craft is only as beautiful as the materials which are used in its construction. And I thought that that was a big sticking point because when you're doing this particular craft, you are going to get great height. You are going to get a high pile or shag. And the beauty of the finished rug will lie in the beauty of the fiber, right? Looking at these beautiful rear rugs, it is looking like at the side of a colorful sheep, like the, a sheep who's dressed up like Joseph in the Technicolor Dreamcoat that texture, that lust, luster is is so closely linked to um, the definition of the rug that it really is um, hard to think about doing this form of rug with materials that aren't really sort of um, beautiful, woolly, lush materials because the feature will be the materials. And the point that Melinda's grandma was making that the craft is only as beautiful as the materials I think for some crafts, you can get away with using materials. You can fudge here and there and save some money here and there. But for a truly glowing Rhea rug, it, I, I feel that you need to use very nice material, right? So that it looks the way that, that it's meant to look. Um, the look of it is a huge part of the prestige of this rug. It's not as pattern driven for us, you know, as rug hookers, we're always talking about patterns and designs. Um, Melinda said earlier in this episode, you can do any design you want, but if you're thinking about doing something that is a bit of a historic look, traditionally going towards those geometrics and abstracts, um, the design is really enhanced by the beautiful material that's being used. She also says later in this advertisement, rugs can be vacuum cleaned or shaken freely. Rear rugs are uh, adaptable to any period house. I love this part popular on the wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, not only as protection, but also as a conversation piece, an interesting contrast on brick, flagstone, or wood floors. Uh, and then it goes on to say, beautiful advertisement, uh, what, the, what the kit would come with. And I thought it was interesting too, I was reading the biography here of Angie, of the grandmother, and, and I was just looking at the part that said, it's very interesting, Melinda, I think you wrote this part, it's very interesting and by no plan or design that I have begun walking the very same path as my grandmother. She just happened upon an, upon an opportunity to bring the off-loom Rhea handcraft to America and 63 years later, I have found myself doing the same. And you know what struck me, 63 years later, she was 63, it said in this article, when the new business started. Maybe 63 is the magic number in your family. I thought that is interesting. Melinda says vacuuming is a rough way to clean them. We did back, we did back in the day, but shaking them out is much better. I'm glad that you added that uh, because they are long pile. And in theory, you could see, like, remember that thing, the Floby that they always used to advertise on TV? You could see the, the pile of it going quite far up the neck of the vacuum or the head of the vacuum, depending on the attachment. So uh, heed that, Melinda is saying, Vacuum, not so good. Shake it out. If you're in the part of the country where you can uh, clean it with snow, then do that. That makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more gentle. Um, and then, you know, in this chapter, it goes into more of the family history in much greater detail, and it is really charming. Uh, for Christmas, when I was in sixth grade, my grandparents gave me a lesson in designing a rear rug and the materials to make the rear rug. So 
somehow I lost I lost this slide. We'll see it later. But Melinda, is this the starburst that you did at that age? Is that is that that first piece? I wonder with pup sleeping on it. Um, I made a very complicated sunburst design, which, to be honest, took me two years to complete. But I still have that Raya a pillow today. Lundgren, the family company, thrived for about 20 years with customers from every state. In the mid-1970s, policies and management at Berka changed. My grandparents suddenly could no longer uh, source the supplies, right? So this is where we start to take a terrible uh, detour. Uh, Melinda says many people hang them as art now. Yeah, you know, we're so familiar with that as rug hookers because some of us put rugs down on the floor um, and they can be very utilitarian, but there's at least just as many people who want them as wall art and regard them as a variation on a tapestry or textile art in general. Uh, most elderly grandparents at this point might have said, well, I guess it's time to retire, but not my grandparents. They mortgaged their house and found a local mill called Harrisville Designs in Harrisville, New Hampshire, to spin the New Zealand fleece to their specifications. It was dyed locally to match the yarn from Sweden. They also commissioned Sherman Textiles of North Carolina to weave backings in two widths. Though I'm wondering, when I read Harrisville, I remember this week, Doreen, you wrote to me, right? You wrote to me, um, we were taught, we were going back and forth on rugs, and you mentioned Harrisville, didn't you? Do you think that this is the same Harrisville? Because you said, well, if you're looking for a simple lap loom or a, whatever, look at a Harrisville, and I just wondered if it could be that same Harrisville. That'd be a funny coincidence. I got to wet my whistle tonight. I'm not doing too good, um, but I'm having a lot of fun. So um, when the new Rhea yarn arrived, I stepped in to assist my grandparents with day-to-day -day operations. Under the tut, I'm doing a lot of paraphrasing here. Under the tutelage of my grandfather, I learned the math and science of designing Rhea's for customers and calculating amounts. My grandmother taught me the business side. This is funny because it's kind of like a traditional reversal. My grandmother taught me the business side of Lundgren Inc., including the bookkeeping, how to write a nice letter. She treated customers like they were the most important people on earth. No computers, n word processors, or email existed in 1978. I hand typed a response to every letter piled in a basket during the two years of inactivity. So while people were asking for supplies and we need our kits, they could not source supplies with Berga anymore, and it took them two years to figure out how to put this new system in place. Um, oh, Doreen sent a message. Same Harrisville for sure. Interesting, isn't it? Oh, Doreen, who was I, ta who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody about rug making. It'll come to me. It's one, of, it's one of my good buddies, I'm sure, who's logged on. Sometimes I confuse our best buddies because we have like a um, little sort of hornet's nest that we go back and forth constantly. God, it'll come to me in a minute. Gosh, what's wrong with me? I might be sick. So she goes on to say, I'm skipping a little bit forward in the story. We had the supplies, we had the designs, we had the energy to serve people, but the business was very slow. At the time, we did not know why. And they kept thinking that advertising and things like changing the formula, um, we talked about books, we did. It'll come to me, it'll come to me. I was having a bunch of conversations after coffee time the other day. So this would be a bit of a puzzlement. Uh, Melinda says, I, bought, um, I brought our supplies to fiber art trade shows to increase exposure. It did not dawn on us that decorating trends had changed and mid-century modern style was on its way out. We noticed advertisements for a new craft called latch hook. It promoted less expensive yarn, a mesh backing, uh, and the visual appearance was similar to Rhea. People were confusing Rhea and latch hook. During the absence of our Rhea supplies, this less expensive and less hardy craft emerged and became widely available. Um, so that is, that choked me up right there. What is wrong with me? There must be something seriously wrong with me. Was the Rhea, this is the next subtitle, was the Rhea heyday over? My mother, Marguerite Peggy Purcell, stepped in to run the business with my grandmother as I was getting married and moving to Maryland for career opportunities. Despite her efforts, the Rhea business continued to slow. My mother had other priorities and eventually she sold uh, the business to a skillful dyer who worked to keep the business alive. But sadly, the Rhea craft was being sought by very few people uh, and without the benefit of the internet reaching across the miles, it was an expensive challenge. In the late 1980s, Lundgren Rhea Incorporated was officially and legally dissolved 
and no more Lundgren yarn has ever been spun. More on that in a little while. In Maryland, I, in Maryland, I happily worked at nature centers from 1982 to 1999, at which point I decided to work for myself as an artist. My life as an artist became very full, teaching drawing classes to children and adults uh, through the local art center, community center, painting carved, uh, carved wood cuts and lino cuts. Uh, you made floor cloths and painted um, glassware. And you maintained a couple of bins of the Lundgren yarn along with a small stash of Swedish wool backings. Then one day I had one backing left with no known access to more. That must have been a punch in the gut kind of a day. I tucked it away while waiting for an inspiration worthy of my last backing. Uh-oh, uh-oh. You know how I get, I get crazy during these shows. And that's when Ken Coons jumps in and does the video. So that's why Melinda's thinking, because there's one backing left of her family legacy. That's why she's thinking, I'm gonna do this rug on video and it's gonna be my last rug. Luckily, that's not the way it turned out, right? Um, so then it goes into the story a, a little bit more about the Lundgrens. Um, it's so, this part is so interesting to me because technically there's, there's a problem, right? Because you stopped sourcing supplies from Scandinavia and um, you, the grandparents figured out how to make it work using people in the U.S. And there's going to be a lot of gaps, right? There's going to be a lot of disconnects. So still there were gaps in the puzzle. And one gap was that the 91 colors that the Lundgrens once had, only 70 of those colors remained, which isn't bad. That's, a v that's very good odds. But many of the designs that were already there required the missing colors. So that was one problem. Um, and then this is interesting. I just have to read this part. Then an amazing thing happened. Where my Google searches for RIA supplies had been fruitless, Nordic fiber artists suddenly started to email me to share their little known RIA supply suppliers. It seems that those who made RIA supplies also provided for other handcrafts of the Nordic region, and they had not advertised or promoted their RIA lines on the internet, or at least not in English. You can see how this is a very big thing, right? I mean, to this day, I struggle with this kind of thing because sometimes I see craft books. There's a lot of great Russian craft books, but with the characters, the alphabet and everything being different, it's very hard to even search for those things, right? Even if they're willing to ship them. So this would be an enormous problem. In just a few months with this change, Google and the language thing and everything uh, suddenly working with technology. Sometimes technology is great. In just a few months, I was connected with two companies in Finland, um, in one in Sweden, one in Norway, bingo. Between all these companies, I had access to about 434 colors of Rhea yarn and multiple widths of backing. Um, and then she goes on to say, maybe you will enjoy Rhea so much that you will become a teacher of the craft. Uh, maybe local mills will start to weave sturdy backing or linen backings once again. I hope so too. I've been thinking about this all day. Um, and I like this part. In buying back Lundgren Rhea, it was as though time had stopped for 35 years. We filled a rental truck with the yarn, which had been carefully stored in cardboard barrels. The fibers could breathe, but no pests had access to the wool. The supplies were exactly as I had remembered them. That's a, that's a choke up, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine this moment? I'm just like riding on the coattails of this family story. It's, it's just unbelievable. Um, I can't imagine the day, Melinda, that you took, you, you and your husband, right, took the truck and went to collect the stuff. It must have been. Was it emotional? I mean, is that a fair question? Was it emotional and crazy? Did you open anything right then or did you just bring it home? And was it just like such a relief to get it back? Or was it like, um, I mean, sometimes I see things like work basket magazines and stuff that my grandmother had and I get f completely fall apart. Uh, I just wonder what it felt like to, to have that experience. I mean, not many people get these kinds of opportunities. Um, the book behind you, you know, it's funny that you, <laughs> it's funny that you said that because while I was reading your book, let me, I'm going to put that on hold for just a second. The next sections of the book um, are super interesting, but I paused um, talking about different people, different makers. And there's a big section on history, which is super exciting, goes way more into the history from way back when, right up into the 20th century. Um, oh, and then I'm, I bracketed this part off. As the demand for Rhea dwindled in the late 1970s, the supplies became scarce. Uh, and, you know, and then she talks about fashions, right? And 
she's using the word fashions. I say pendulum. It's the same thing, isn't it? The pendulum swings. The fashions change. People don't want what they wanted before. People don't want to do handcrafts, right? So this is a huge, um, this is a huge thing. That brings us to this book because I was still, I was still in the shade of the of the lifeguard stand when I came to this page. And so there's there's lots in this book about other people, and that's one of the things I love about it. There's lots of history. There's lots of family history. There's lots of how to knowledge and instruction, very clear. But there's lots of other people in this book, and I love I love that. So this is what it says uh, for this page. Nell Zamoroski, uh, I guess is how you might pronounce it. As I was beginning to gather information for this book, I called John Chick Colony at Harrisville Designs in New Hampshire. I knew so few people who were knowledgeable about, oh gosh, I thought I just, I thought I just had who I was talking about Harrisville. What is wrong with me? So few people who were knowledgeable um, about Rhea Yarns. I thought I'd start with the man who designed my grandparents' line. When my questions became too right, Rhea specific, Colony said, those questions are better answered by Nell. He proceeded to tell me about Nell Zamorowski, the color line designer for Harrisville Designs. Then I recalled why her name was familiar. My parents had two books written by Nell, which I had enjoyed reading as a teenager. I telephoned her a few times with questions and found her to know more about Rhea than anyone I knew. I visited Nell in her home on the Upper East Side of New York City where she generously shared her portfolios with me uh, and confirmed her interest in uh, being a resource person for me. Um, and I think this part is just, I just wanna read you this part, it's so nice. This page talking about Nell, um, I wanna read you what Nell said because it's, uh, Nell is remembering, right, how she's getting into Rhea. But I have to add with this book, I looked up while I was still on the beach, I looked up Nell Zamorowski on eBay and A-Books and Amazon, and I saw two books come up. I saw three books come up, and I think one of them was a reprint. And I, I um, favorited them, and I thought, I'll do this later because the kids were driving me nuts and it was time to go. So um, we, we left the beach, right, and we had all the blankets, and I was putting them in the back of the car, and I always have a ton of books in the back of the car. Uh, because I pick them up at thrift stores and when I see them and I always mean to take them out of the back of the car but I'm usually lazy and I don't do it well guess what book was sitting on top when I was throwing the towels down it was this book and I went god that looks from I mean, it's been back there for two months I've been lazy for that long I said oh my god that looks like the cover and I Nell Zamorowski I mean it's it's great life is full of crazy coincidences right if you call them coincidences I just thought that was so interesting Oh, Melinda said, yes, it was emotional and crazy. You're giving me the chills. I'm sorry. That is so funny. What an amazing journey. And it isn't over yet. That's right. It's, I'd like to think it's just beginning, right? We're going to all dig into Rhea Rugs, and it's going to be a huge renaissance. And everybody's going to be happy, especially Melinda. So Nell Zamorowski remembers, and this is, quote, I was seduced by the finished Rhea Rugs when I first saw them in an exhibition at the old uh, George Jensen store on Fifth Avenue and 53rd New York City. Uh, that was back in the 1950s. Now remember from that article I read at the beginning how it said that, or maybe Melinda, maybe it was you in the uh, preface or the foreword, it said that rear rugs were known 10 years earlier in New York City. This is probably when Nell saw them for the first time, right? These rugs were winners in an international design show in Milan, Italy. The seduction was easy. The colors were beautiful and their blending was as close to painting on canvas as I'd ever seen. This was painting in wool. The blending happened because of the high pile and perhaps the use of different colors in one knot. Ponytail, right? It's not really called the ponytail, is it? That's just suggestions for colors. I shouldn't say that because that's uh, misleading. I was hooked, pardon the pun, and I knew I had to work in this medium, which I did for the next 20 to, sorry, 30 to 40 years either for commissions or exhibitions or as a designer in, uh, in, the, in the industry. I even went to Finland on a Fulbright scholarship. That's very impressive. For one year, took in all the uh, Rhea beauty around and the information that was around me. But trends change in art as well as in fashion and the Rhea effect seemed to get lost. I'm happy to see that Melinda Bird is restoring interest in this former art. There is so much joy in working with colors and yarn and thanks to Melinda, this joy is once again available to all. 
So Nell wrote that um, May 6, 2016. Um, absolutely beautiful. So you see that this rug behind Nell, and I do have the stuff in the slideshow, but I must have ordered things the wrong way. Beautiful stuff like this in the book. That is the rug. So lots of, lots of behind the scenes glimpses um, into the making and designing of these rugs. So uh, yeah, and then carrying on with more history, more people who have been involved, more designs, more everything. It's, it's a beautiful, Melinda, it's a beautiful, big, dense book um, that brings you to the Rhea process. What is the Rhea process, right? And then you're seeing the back end, you're seeing the needle, you're seeing how you draw the knots through. You're seeing incredible examples of these rugs. And Melinda says, uh, actually, I sell a bundle of all the yarn colors I carry, and I list it in Etsy as a Rhea ponytail, but that's not an official term. It's a great term, though. It's yours, so we all know what that is. Um, and I hope that I put a link to the Etsy store. If you're not seeing it there under the description, feel free. Feel free, um, Melinda, or anybody that's looking at links to, that are relevant to this conversation to put them into the side there, right? We don't need boobs.com tonight. Let us have one Friday night without boobs.com. But I would love to see some links that have to do with some of the things that we're talking about. And the next chapter is all about supplies. So you can see how this is not only a beautiful history book, um, it's a how-to book and a gallery. Uh, and then lots and lots on backings, right? Because there's lots of different, not just different widths and sizes of backing, but different, different backings. And then there's a section that will answer uh, one of the questions that came up, vintage backings, right? So we're going to do some gallery looking in just a minute. I love this picture. I wish I put this one into the slideshow. I just love those colors. And you see what I mean by tactile. Thank you, Melinda. The Etsy shop is called Bird Call, and that's with a Y studio. Bird Call, one word with a Y studio. Um, you can see how tactile it is and how it would be so relaxing and satisfying to be handling um, you know, my, my daughter is eight and she loves these fidget toys, right? And I, I, I still don't get it, but I mean, we have, we have broken bank on fidget toys over the last couple of years. They all do different things. They either spin or they twirl or you rub them or they click or something. You press buttons and, you know, it, it she's a little, she's a little bit, um, like ADHD, very, very busy person. And it helps her relax when she's playing with this stuff. And I'm just thinking, you know, we, we all have different ways, don't we? My way is to touch something like this, to touch our textiles. I mean, we all have different ways, but I can see it would be extremely um, relaxing to be working on a rug like this and to be able to run your fingers through it, right? Uh, I, I haven't done it yet, and I'm, I'm dying to run my fingers through because right now the only thing that I run my fingers through is the dog to make sure there's no ticks on him. This would be much nicer. This would be much, much nicer. So lots of history, a recipe for Rhea yarn, needles, graph paper, um, things about the sheep, uh, drawing out your pictures on this graph paper that makes it really easy to design. It's everything you need to know. By looking at this book, you're going to absolutely know how to make a re-rug with these kinds of super, super uh, detailed and clear uh, photographs that will walk you right through the whole process. So there are no ticks on Rhea's snow. <laughs> no, there's been no ticks on the dog this summer, too. I'm so happy because... Sometimes that's a thing, you know, it's so gross uh, living in this part of the country. But so many beautiful projects that are so different, right? Lots of interesting things that you can get into. One of the questions, Melinda, that I asked you the other day, um, more on more great people, right, who are working in Rhea Rugs, just, it's just so much. It's so much goodness in one book. I have not read the whole book by any means. I just broke it down in my head into sections so we could talk tonight. Um, but also pillows, throws, coverlets, clothing accessories, right? So lots of different things that you might do. Um, Melinda, I asked you the other day when we were on the phone, I said, you know, and this is a to be continued, but could it be possible, because this is a weave, um, could it be possible to do something? And this, I'm trying to build a bridge here for uh, those of us who are rug hookers and are thinking, ooh, well, I'd like to try something new. It's out of my comfort zone. I'm trying to make it more in your comfort zone by thinking, is it possible to do a piece that is in part Rhea and in part hooking? Because wouldn't that be a thing? Wouldn't that be a thing? Um, and then I thought to myself, God, would that be called hookeria? And I thought, no, that doesn't sound right, does it? That sounds explosive, not in the right way. Um, 
But, but Melinda said, possibly, right? So this is a to be continued, because if that were the case, can you imagine the possibilities of that? We would be talking, we shouldn't even be talking about this, right? I should be writing a book on it right now, but I just don't have the time. It's all yours if it works. Um, it's something that we're going to investigate in great detail, and I will give you a definitive answer soon. This whole chapter is about designing. Um, you know, and I think that as rug hookers, I, I run a whole series of design classes, as you know, every month, and um, this is one of the most popular things I do with this with the Ribbon Candy Hooking brand. So many people are interested in designing. Um, so many people are so intimidated by designing. So it's so nice with this rug form, you can see how you could get your head around designing, right? Looking at the kinds of designs that sometimes being drawn directly onto the backing, particularly if you are looking at traditional Rhea designs, and I'm just going to say traditional, that's probably not right. They, they tend to be more geometrics and abstracts. So thinking along those lines, you might be thinking to yourself, well, can I get away with something really simple like an ombre fade? Well, absolutely. Or geometric? Absolutely. Rhea, Rhea tie. That sounds better. You saw where I was going with the other thing. It was, yeah, it was problematic, right? Uh, but I love the idea of a fusion, not just of those two things, but I mean, when you're talking about working on a fabric um, backing, right? Foundation cloth is fabric and not mesh like latch. Um, then you are also looking at, of course, the possibility of doing anything else with a needle. Like we've talked a lot about Erica Wilson, um, famous sort of needlepoint, all textiles, all, all um, needle crafts, very popular in the 70s, British, British woman who had a show that sometimes I post her videos on our Facebook group. I just, I love her so much. Um, you could see doing that kind of cruel stitching, Bargello stitching, any kind of long stitch or any kind of stitch onto any fabric background backing. So these are all things that we can think about because I think as we travel on with pushing our rug hooking um, into, into extremes and into um, sampler styles, then we start thinking to ourselves, well, what else can I do? Am I limited to loops? What if I would like a lot more variety? What if I would like something that looks much more in the style of the British or Canadian rug that has a lot of height um, differences, a lot of variety, a lot of interest? Um, maybe I can look at doing other techniques on my same piece, right, uh, to give it that kind of breadth and, and diversity within one piece. I just think it's a great thing to think about, and it's a, co it's a conversation that we need to further. So I'm going to move on in a minute, but this book, I think you know that I love it. Melinda says, Real Rhea is an heirloom craft, just as traditional rug hooking. These items will be listed in your will. Um, I absolutely agree. And, you know, we, we keep saying this in rug hooking, too. I am the, I never label stuff, and I must. I never finish stuff. That's the problem. But um, absolutely, right? These are like labors of love, very time-consuming projects. It is good to for all of our rugs, right? Rhea rugs, hooked rugs, all of our big projects like this, they are heirlooms. Quilters are so much better at labeling stuff, aren't they? We are way behind the curve when it comes to labeling our stuff. And I think we are way behind the curve when it comes to regarding our things as heirlooms, right? We do need to think along those lines more often. Just making the point, this, this design part of the book is just beautiful. So I'm probably going to come back to this at some point because I said, oh, wow, in projecting your work, um, so again, introducing different people who have different techniques and ways of working, and this is a, I'm only up to here in the book, right? So I've, I've got more than half of the book left. You can imagine how much good stuff is in here. I'm going to move to the slideshow a little bit so we can start looking at more rugs together. Oh, boy. So... Let's do this. I want to see. Da -da 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 -da. I want to see um, what else I had in here, and we might double up on some of these because I put three slideshows together, so I didn't have the freezing problem I had last Friday night. That was super stressful. I think. Yep, we saw. Um, I'm just r running back through. So, um, Melinda. So some. Um, you have a bunch of patterns on your website that are traditional patterns. Um, it is hard to find, for sure, books on Rhea, right? Like traditional uh, catalogs, old-time old time vintage stuff. I have a whole bunch. This is the one that I turned up uh, recently. So Rama, Raya, 
Um, and, I, you know, I'll probably cover this in another episode because there's lots of beautiful color rugs and stuff in here. It is quite hard to find these catalogs online. But Melinda has, on her website, Bird Call Studio, has tons of catalogs. Um, I guess the word is digitalized. You're, it's possible to see them. Go through the pages and look at all the work. Whether you're looking at it for a design idea or you're looking at it for a color palette idea, it's great for that. So, Melinda, a huge thank you for doing that, for putting those catalogs online for people to see, because there's tons of images for us to see of Rhea rugs on there. And it is very hard otherwise. Good morning in Australia, Gail. Good to see you. It is very difficult otherwise to find a lot of images. You see rugs and stuff on eBay, but those original catalog designs, Melinda has tons of them. So this would be an example of that kind of thing. You'd see a page like this. Uh, there would often be uh, more than one color scheme, right, Melinda? You'd see it maybe two or three different color palettes. Uh, many Rhea rugs, I am noticing, and I said this the other day, are working with analogous colors, not necessarily uh, complementary colors, but obviously these are all like red families. It's almost like a monochromatic rug. You get this kind of design sometimes in reds, and then again in blue, uh, then again in green, and then one would choose which one they wanted to do. This one, Anemone, I think I took all of these uh, from your site, do you think that sounds right? I think Anatomy is from your Etsy store. I just thought color-wise, this is very contemporary. Uh, it's so interesting, it's an abstract, but it could be read as like a doorway or a portal or a rainbow. Could be read as uh, many suns in the sky with many birds, lots of interesting things. Melinda says, I sell all of those kits when the supplies are available. Lately, supplies are slow in coming. So that is something to think about too and to talk about. Um, it's also worth saying that I said to Melinda, I'm going to be headed down to Maryland, hopefully within the next couple of months, because with this new book I'm working on for Rug Hooking Magazine, one of the rugs I'm making for it is going to be a Rhea rug. Um, so I've already started stocking up on supplies, and I'll tell you about that to give you the same opportunity. Um, but I'm going to travel down there and sit with Melinda and show her the design I have in mind. It's based on an artist who I ho haven't said yet because I can't tell all my content for this next book as you can imagine um, but it's a beautiful idea and I just want to choose the right colors and I want to do that with Melinda sitting right next to me right so we'll do a lovely video down there probably several um, so you can get another window into it a little bit later on uh, more toward the fall right um, a little bit later on we'll definitely get another whack at looking at Melinda's studio in person looking at the supplies in person touching the supplies that is to be continued and we will see, you know, what has transpired in the meantime as far as supplies. Because what Melinda is saying is just like, you know, same thing as in your grandparents' day, there is a problem with getting supplies right now. And it is a known problem. So it could be something that slows the, the aspiring Rhea maker uh, a little bit for this moment. But let's see what happens in the near future. And I will certainly be giving you an update on Rhea rugs and visiting with Melinda in the near future, right? So we can talk about this some more and figure out where we are with kits for everybody who wants a kit. Um, I just loved this design. So this was one that was in, I think, the Etsy store. I pulled a bunch of Melinda's designs. Um, this one as well. This was, is this um, black and white, Melinda, or is this more like, um, this has such a steampunky look, doesn't it? It's like a little bit art deco, a little bit steampunky. It's just a great design. I feel like there's a little bit of teal and green in there. Um, it's such a great piece. You know, when I look at these rugs, they, of course, they span several decades, right? Not, not Melinda's, but some of the ones we're about to look at and some of the ones we have looked at. The 70s ones sometimes have a real specific look because of the palette that was so distinctive and popular, that Brady Bunch palette during that time. But you can see getting away from that exact palette when you're looking at rugs that have um, earlier, more pure mid-century modern palettes. In contemporary rear rugs, we're looking at rugs where you can do anything you want with the color. Really cool. I mean, this reminds me more of like a swatch watch with colors I like more, right? A, a, a nice warm red and then some cool kind of gray blues, stone blues. Uh, looks like maybe brown at the bottom. Just great color choices. Um, and looking at a lot of these rugs is going to help you with making choices about colors, right? Uh, that's going to be a great inspiration. Now, I want to come over here uh, and let me see what I put into this slideshow. Let's walk together through. You know what? I'm going to go to this one first. I'm going to err on the safe side. 
I'm going to uh, make a little departure here. And Melinda's with us because I'm going to be constantly asking uh, your opinion on stuff too. I want to kind of blaze through um, some of the rear rugs that I found online, right? And Melinda, feel free to just jump in anytime. It was blues and beiges. Very nice. I can't, I honestly can't wait. It's the only thing I've been thinking about uh, is making that visit. So my follow through thought, I'm going to say it. And I know I'm, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot when I say it, but confession time, right? Confession time. So once I read this story, I was super, super moved by it. And I got, I, I woke up in the middle of the night, guess what time? 3.11, as always. And I started to have a, a scarcity thought, right? And you know that I hate myself when I do this. When I go into scarcity mode, like uh, everyone else is going to get everything and I'm not going to get my favorite things in the whole world. I, this is what happens at 3.11 in the morning. And I woke up and I started thinking, I think that Melinda has Lundgren yarn on her Etsy page. And first thing I did when I woke up was start going through her Etsy page because I realized that that Lundgren yarn, Melinda, that was your grandparents' yarn that was in those cardboard barrels. And it's finite, right? Because that was the, the when your grandmother and grandfather um, had it made, that was, that was it after that. So it has not been made since. There's not more being made. There's different sources for the yarn that's being used for the rear rugs that Melinda's making and I will be making and hopefully all of us will be making. But that Lundgren yarn is unique. And I went on to the Etsy store um, and I bought my, some of my favorite colors because I, forgive me, I'm such a pig. I was just afraid that if I waited too long, I wouldn't get some of my favorite colors. And for me, it's super important that when I do my first Rhea rug, that I'm using some of Melinda's grandparents' yarn, right? That's like, once it's in there, you can't get it out. So I'm all, I'm, the reason I'm saying it is because I'm letting you know there are a lot of amazing things that are in Melinda's store. And one of those things is that vintage yarn. And when something is finite, that's all I'm saying. So exciting, huh? So let's look at some of these rugs together that I found on, um, on the internet. 70s owl. <laughs> I know, Ryan. So this is, now, Melinda, chime in. This is sold by a seller called Swanksville. I love that name. Rare vintage mid-century Danish modern 1960s, 70s Rhea shag rug with owls, blue colors. Cool vintage 60s, 70s mid-century Danish modern Rhea shag rug in colorful multi-shades of blues, turquoise with owls on black branches. This is a hard-to-find rug in beautiful condition. 25 and a half by 47, unmarked. So I pulled this rug up and I thought, unexpected, I mean, for me, unexpected, because I'm thinking geometrics and um, abstracts. And I thought, wait a minute, is this going to be a latch rug, right? Is this going to be one of these, like, pulling my chain incidents? So I looked at a few of the photos of it, and when they flipped it over, I thought, it is a rear rug, isn't it? I mean, Melinda, would you say that the owls is a rear rug? I'm looking at the stitches and thinking, it looks almost like a tapestry in the back, but that sort of bias or the, or the part at the bottom that's, that's stitched up, right, to hide it, the hem, that to me looks like a rear rug. Um, so I thought, you know what, maybe it is. It just, it doesn't have those very pronounced vertical lines that I've come to expect to see when I'm looking at a rear rug. So I was curious about this because it certainly looked handmade. It was a beautiful design. I forget how much, $145, buy it now. Um, Melinda said, my nephew um, designed his own Rhea. He used all Lundgren yarn, which I thought was really cool. That is really cool. Yes, you could call that a Rhea, but it looks machine made. Interesting. So there we go. Now this answers an earlier question. I think it is going to take somebody like Melinda sitting next to us for a while to be able to make these calls, right? Let's see how far we get in the slideshow tonight and what we can learn about what we're looking at. This is a similar owl that was called Vintage Mid-Century Wall Hanging Owl Carpet Art Shag Rug Danish Rhea MCM, meaning Mid-Century Modern, sold by Callswall, and that's C-A-L-S-W-A-L, $130 plus $10 shipping, clean, smoke-free, no rips, no uh, stains, great shape, unframed, handmade. So I thought, interesting, is this another um, owl rear rug? Because I, again, I'm used to seeing geometrics and abstracts. And I thought, let's get closer. I do see like a division of rows from row to row. You see 
differences in height. And for me, that was consistent with the rear rug. But then I saw this and I thought that is not a rear rug. I mean, what I, I don't think it's Melinda. What do you think? I thought it might be. It's still on fabric backing. I suppose it could be another machine made one because that's not latch backing. That's not that stiff stuff, right? It's still a fabric backing. So this is almost like a game show where we're, we're really putting Melinda on the spot. Um, I wonder if it's this one's homemade. I just thought it was curious to find two examples with owls and this back also threw me. So whereas let's come down just a little bit. The owl again. Yeah, <laughs> I know, Ryan. It's so true, isn't it? So this one, the back looked like that. Maybe it's just that it's larger. Maybe the wool is smaller. This one looks very different in the back machine made or latch hook. It could be, but it doesn't look like latch backing for me at all, unless they hand stitched that tape, right? That twill tape um, binding to the edges of the latch hook. If that is the case, this could well be latched. This is a bit of a mystery. They are calling it a rear rug, but of course, people who are selling stuff online, they don't necessarily know what they're talking about. And you really cannot buy this. You know, that could be latch, couldn't it? They, it looks like they might have hand sewn. Look at those little stitches going around. I think I'm leaning toward latch. What are you all thinking? You, anybody can chime in with, with a thought. It looks like it, it looks to me like it's latch. Now closer up, the border being fabric tricked me for a minute. But the border goes all the way around. Anybody else have a guess? No binding tape is used in Rhea. No, then it's got to be latch, doesn't it? And, and really, at the end of the day, it truly looks like a latch design, doesn't it? I mean, it's just lovely. But it just goes to show you have to be so careful when you're buying stuff, particularly if it's an investment online, because you, I agree, Karen, I think it's latched. Um, you really don't want to spend 130 is not obviously the top of, of the spectrum for uh, something handmade, but nonetheless, it's not free. Uh, you don't want to be buying something that you don't know what it is. Laura, we're in agreement. It's, uh, people are chiming in now, and there's so many people who, here who have so much more expertise than I have. I'm just the mouthpiece. Uh, but I agree. I think that was a tricky one. Isn't it funny how tricky that was? Because it looked like it had those Rhea stitches, but the trick was, or the clue was, that it was stitched all the way around with that twill tape uh, that we bind hook drugs with. And it's probably because the latch is so uh, pointy, right, and spiky on the edges. Makes a lot of sense to hand sew those little stitches all the way around. But that almost got me. Maybe it almost got you too. But interesting, right? Latch. Oh, Doreen says latch. So this one was interesting to me too. Now, I have to say, I... I love the abstracts and the geometrics the most for myself. Um, something like this, it really does have that mid-century modern look, no doubt about it. Uh, this is very odd. This is very specific. But for somebody who, who, who likes um, this sort of um, era of design and this color palette, this is a real find. I mean, this is very odd and a real find. Beautifully done, uh, probably, we'll see. I was going to say handmade piece, but let's see. Two foot by three foot rear rug, shag rug, mid-century modern, Danish shag rug, 1960s, small rug, bunny, rabbit, sold by Jewel, 959-4926. Right, so if you're interested in that rug, you can always play that back. Um, an interesting and unique mid-century rear shag rug in great condition, free of odor stains, discoloration, recently professionally cleaned and ready to be enjoyed in your space. Uh, $369.85. I think it's um, super, super curious, right? Interesting. Let's let's close in a little bit. Um, again, it's very specific. So this is not my taste at all. But if it were, I would be leaving this show, don't do it, and going over to eBay to snap this thing up because you, you good luck finding another one. It's one of those, right? Melinda says, and the rear backing would show horizontal rows uh, half an inch apart. Okay, so that that's very good information. So based on what you've said so far, Melinda, I'm going to say this is not a latch, right? Because we don't have the side uh, binding. We have what's going to be a top and bottom binding. And I'm going to say, based on your last comment, that this, if I were in a shop and I'm not an authority, I would say to myself, I think that this is a machine-made rear rug. 
right? And there's probably, there is nothing wrong with that. It's just you don't want to buy it thinking it's handmade when it's not handmade. Melinda, are you saying no, you don't think it's a um, machine made rug or not that, that it's not a handmade rug, the bunny? There's such a delay. That's one of the bummers about being live. Machine made in Denmark. Okay, excellent. So that was super, that was super information. See, so now we're getting it. If we can all remember the differences, this looks very different. And we're going to see some backings to rear rugs pretty soon right now, actually. Um, and that will help us know how to distinguish between one that's handmade and one that is not handmade. So in this example, I think this is another, uh, this is another sort of uh, pictorial. And I just thought they were cool to pull off because there's not very many of them uh, that are rear rugs. 1970s vintage peacock high pile rear rug by uh, Echa, E-G-E, -E, Rhea, Taper, T-A-E-P-P-E-R, Deluxe, Denmark. Three foot by four foot, uh, nothing else specified. And it's sold by a company, a uh, eBay store called Turkish underscore rugs. Used in very good condition, professionally washed, ready to use. Uh, free shipping, $850. Uh, decade 1970s, producer EGE Taper, Denmark material, 100% cotton and wool. The rug is a great example of 1960s pop art interior made in high quality Danish Rhea weaving technique called Eja Taper in Denmark in the 1970s. It is made of 100% wool cotton, repetitive. It features a minimalist and abstract peacock illustration in very strong colors, an interesting piece for every modern home in a lovely vintage condition. Will fit well with any, and then they go on to talk about what you know what it fits well with. There's no stains, no, no problems. Um, this one is a classic Melinda. Interesting. It is vintage uh, in MCM, but not a real Rhea. So this is going to be another machine made. Okay, great. Isn't this great? I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying this episode more than any, I think, because I'm learning right now, and I know you are too. It is beautiful, and it's nice to know that it's a classic. Design-wise, it's stellar. Um, and, you know, you can look at a rug like this that's machine made, and, and it'll give you ideas for what you want to do with your rug, won't it? Because when I look at this checkerboard, how they're uh, sort of alternating colors or using different colors, alternating the inner and outer colors. And the, I like the black and how they carry the black, right, in little stripes down to the bottom. It just adds some interest. Um, all these little effects that you can get. Okay, so that really does seem just like the others, doesn't it? It looks just like the others. So now at this point in the show, we should be getting into that kind of rhythm or pattern of being able to look at the back and say, I got this. It's definitely not a latch hook. It's a rear rug, but it is not a handmade rear rug. This one I really love. Scandinavian modernist rear rug, wall hanging, yellow floral, 1960s to 1970s. God, I love this one so much. Um, Baba Inc. So B-A-B-A-I-N textiles. Baba, sorry, B-A-B-A-K-I-N textiles. That's the seller. A vintage Scandinavian rear rug, wall hanging, charming, modernist floral design. Pink and blue flowers set against a pale yellow background. Good quality and condition. Um, this is in Great Britain, 96 centimeters by 60 centimeters. Um, $180, which equates to about 216 right now, plus uh, $88 shipping. So it hurts to pay that much shipping, but at the same time, it's not um, a super expensive rug. Um, I'm just so in love with this one. It's crazy. I shouldn't have put it in there. I should have waited until I could, sa could save up a little bit. But absolutely beautiful. And you do see that sort of staggered pattern of the rose. You see in this one those color changes, both in that sort of buttery light, light yellow background, a little bit of lighter color chunks just put in in different places. Um, absolutely amazing. Babak is real Raya, Melinda says. Um, yes, you can definitely make your own with similar designs. Pictorials sometimes need to be simplified. So, so, you know, same kind of rule that we're talking about. When you have a design in mind, if you are a primitive rug hooker and you are used to hooking strips that are eight and above, the very wide ones and above, or ones that you rip, you know the sort of silly rule, but it can work if you're doing like a welcome mat size thing and you are using your Sharpie to transfer or create your design. If your Sharpie, the, with that, the regular Sharpie, right, like the big tip that it has, um, not the fine one, right? The regular the, the chisel or the, the fine point still has a big tip. But if you draw that 
and it becomes a mess of lines. As a primitive piece, it's probably too busy. And you want to think about simplifying your designs. Probably the same simple little tricks like that would work, maybe with rear rugs too. And you know what else works? Just starting it, and when you realize it's too busy, fly by the seat of your pants, right? You're making a rug, right? You're not, you're not operating on someone's brain. You're making a rug. You can change your mind. You can change direction. It'll, be, it'll benefit from those changes and those departures from what you thought. Um, because it, it, you just have to have that confidence to think, to think on your feet, right? You just have to, because it's going to be beautiful no matter what, because it's yours. So I'm just absolutely in love um, with the colors. And in sort of the trunk or stem part of this particular piece, you see that there are color changes in there. And you see those little flecks, Syrah style flecks of turquoise and like that raspberry color. I mean, isn't that something? I just love that piece. And this is the back of it. So here we have much more pronounced lines. Now, Melinda, do you have, because I know I've seen pieces where the lines are top to bottom vertical. And on this one, the lines are side to side. Do you make a conscious choice about whether you want the orientation of your piece, landscape versus portrait, to be horizontal versus um, vertical? based on how you want those, the shag to fall, or is it much more common sense, like, well, I have more material this way, or this piece would fit on this scrap, so I'm going to use this scrap, and it's vertical, and I want it to be horizontal, but it's not, and who cares, because it's still beautiful. Is it, is it like any of the above? Is it, you know, multiple choice A, B, or C? I'm just wondering, because I know I've seen this both ways. This is another one that I'm just Oh, I'm crazy about. So vintage Scandinavian Swedish wool, wool re weaving rug wall decor floor carpet, 1960s, pre-owned, very good condition, lovely decor, 51 by 36 centimeters, sold by Mac underscore, Mac M-A-C underscore de decor, um, Great Britain pounds, $78, uh, shipping another $42 to the U.S. Vintage Scandinavian uh, Swedish wool Rhea weaving rug wall decor floor carpet 1960s. So that's the description of this one. Just make it bigger. That's a good. That's a good idea. Um, that's right. Just make it bigger, and then you don't have to worry about losing the lines that might be important to you. Right? Ryan is the king of making epic, huge pieces. <laughs> the poster boy. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, it's a good idea to, to be able, if you can do that and you have the money to get the supplies to complete um, something much bigger, then you can keep all your lines, right? I just love this piece. I just think there's so much charm right here. And looking at it close up, um, I just love the colors. Don't you love the colors? Like uh, there's the, the yellow roses, like the friendships and the reds, and then the pink flowers with some mixy mixes. And then the light, like buttery yellow colors again. And then those grapey colors that probably is some kind of a drooping flower, like a lilac or something like that. Um, I just think this is just gloriously pretty. This, these two, the ones in uh, the UK, are the ones that I really, really love. And this is the backing. So you can see it distinctly looks different. Now, Melinda, on the bottom left-hand corner of this shot, I'm just noticing there's a fringe. When people have a fringe, are they just pulling out the last um, threads of the woven rows of the backing and tying them into knots? Is that how they're getting there? Oh, this orange juice is saving me tonight. Um, another true beauty. A modernist Scandinavian Riera green and yellow abstract 1960s, 1970s, 150 centimeters, another by Babic, Babic in textiles. It says, in good, smart condition. 275 pounds, that's about $330, approximately $90 for shipping. A good quality mid-century Scandinavian rear rug decorated with a striking green, yellow and brown abstract design, rare to find in such good condition. Could easily be adapted to be a wall hanging. Um, this is just another beauty in my mind. Um, love the color. It does, it does have that sort of late 60s, 1970s Brady Bunch palette happening. Um, but it has more, right? There's more variety. The brown hasn't gone completely to brown yet. It's more of that kind of gold ochre. I do, I do love this rug. 
not as much as the others. So let's see what we get on the back of this. A lot of these listings have these beautiful, so this does look, Melinda, let me know what you think, but this does look okay. Judging from the rules that we have so far and what we've seen so far, and again, like you're getting that binding in two places, not in four places. Um, so interesting. The game continues. This is another real beauty. Um, I love the size of this one too. It's a bit unexpected. Vintage Raya rug with triangles, mid-century modern, wall hanging rug, multicolor. Sold by Retro Cube Home. Vintage Raya rug with triangles from the 60s. Multicolor. Okay, so this is problematic in the description. It says multicolor latch hook rug fits perfectly in a, mo a mid-century modern retro or eclectic bohemian home decor. Um, I don't like to read things that are opinion. I mean, I think so too, but handmade rug uh, for floor or wall hanging. Typical, mid it's 21 by 48 inches. Typical mid-century multicolor palette, geometric triangular pattern catches the eye. Boho mid-century interior, yada, yada, yada. The vintage latch hook tapestry is made of cotton yarn on a cotton base. $150 free shipping. So this sounds, just shutting the fan off because I'm. it's not helping, um, looks like an Inca pattern. Oh, Karen, I think you probably meant this one, right? Wait a minute. Let me see if I can get in there. I think that's maybe the one that you meant looks like an Inca pattern absolutely beautiful it does have that very ethnic uh, feel to it um, super beautiful are you as worried as I am about the t double mention of latch hook in this particular rug let's see I honestly don't remember um, well it doesn't look like a latch hook rug at all to me it looks like a it looks like a Rhea or a commercially made Rhea rug to me um, I'm not seeing the possibility for latch at all it is a gorgeous rug I have to say um, as a mid-century modern piece, you know, fooling around with triangles is one of the big tropes of that era. Uh, this is a real signature looking piece for sure. Um, and if you love the, oh, look at how mushy it is too. It's all mushed up. This definitely does not look like a latch hook rug to me. This looks like it must be a Rhea. And the question will be, um, oh, you looked, that one looked like it was a real Rhea rug going by the backing. The one with all the flowers. Am I right or am I wrong? Lynn is asking. I'm, I'm wondering too. Melinda says the fringe was on all the hand woven backings from the 50s and 60s. Then backings started to be woven um, much wider, longer, and hemmed. That is, that is a, a gem. So let me say that again. The fringe, the fringe was on all hand woven backings from the 50s and 60s. That's a great thing to know. Write that one down on a post-it note, right? Um, or lock it in. Then backings started to be woven much wider and then they could be uh, longer and hemmed. So that's making me think, Melinda, I can't believe I haven't thought of this yet. Because there are different sizes of Rhea backings and because when we're looking at the back of them, two sides are always finished and two sides are hemmed, that must follow that unlike rug hooking where you can just cut into it and use this next piece for a different project that in doing Rhea you are nodding right to the, the width of the backing dictates the size of the piece is that is am I correct in thinking that and then if you have a longer piece maybe you can go longer and you hem it top to bottom but you can't hem it all four ways that's the uh, vibe that I'm getting anyway the further we go into this and I'm figuring a little bit out Melinda says you could make a fringe now by stripping away the weft and create, and that's the horizontal part that goes across, right? The um, not the warp, but the weft, pulling those threads out, just like we do with monk's cloth or linen, right? When they fall out accidentally because your zigzag stitch wasn't good enough, by stripping away the weft and creating an artificial fringe, perfectly fine. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? You could do that. You could plan for that. Interesting. So let me come back over here. Now, I'm in suspense over this piece. I feel that it is a Rhea, and, and I mean, I, I really love this piece, I have to say. Um, I know somebody else needs this piece. Uh, it, it, I don't need this one. I like the little floral ones from England, but this is such a mid-century modern statement, and it looks to me, so this looks like a problem here. So I know Melinda's going to chime in with this. Karen's asking, um, you can sew thin, or can you sew um, thin lengths together? 
and Melinda says, true, you're right about the width being a fixed width. So that dictates the width of your piece. And then it's just a question of top to bottom. How long is your piece? This looks like a problem to me because I'm looking at this backing and I'm thinking, this is a latch, isn't it? Incredibly, this is a latch, but this looks like a latch. This is a mesh backing. I might be wrong. Um, I'm going to defer to Melinda. Karen, yes. Okay, good. Um, but to me, just glancing at this, it looks like a latch that has been done in luxurious fabrics, not the, the pre-cut acrylic that we are used to seeing. And if that is the case, with latch, you could get a very different look. Um, although, uh, whatever Melinda says is going to trump, right? Because I just don't know. It's going to trump what I'm saying because I don't know as much. But this looks to me like a very stiff weave for a backing. And that seems that, oops, wait a minute. I went too fast. That seems bad. Um, definitely latch hook. Okay, good, good. But you know, this is a great example of a latch hook rug that was not hooked in acrylics, and you can see it has a much more luxurious look to it. Of course you can latch hook in, in virgin wool or in any wool or in any material. And just like um, Melinda's grandmother said, the look of your work, the, the beauty of your work is going to depend on the materials that you use. So for some people, and I've said this before, for rug hookers, some rug hookers love to hook with yarn and they love acrylic yarn. And that's just what they love. And they've hooked with red heart or lion yarn for decades. And it's what they love. They love knowing that that crimson red is always the crimson red and that mustard is always the same mustard and it never changes. And their work is beautiful and many of these people sell in galleries. But if you want something that's wool, sometimes the pre-made latch kits are not for you. And if that's the case, you might want to think about uh, doing, if you, if you really do want to do a latch as opposed to a rhea, um, think about using different materials, right? Or doing a rhea. If you prefer the idea of using the needle and trying this technique, I would give it a shot, right? This is another one of my favorites. I was seriously thinking about this and then I thought, no, don't. There's many amusement parks to go to this summer. I best not. But I think this is an extraordinary rug. This is a, the title of this one, Vintage Rhea Shag Rug, Wall, Mid-Century, Sweden, Orange, Yellow, Green Abstract, signed MCM, Thas Nifty, T-H-A-S, N-I-F-T-Y, $99 plus $8.22 shipping. Vintage Rhea, Shag Rug, Wall, Mid-Century, uh, Sweden, uh, Orange, Yellow, Green Abstract, um, Rug is Simply Fantastic, uh, previous owner had wall hanging, bold colors, abstract design, previous owner dated it 1972, the year that I was born. So this is one that I really, really like. Um, another one that I really like. Super pretty. But again, looking at the great uh, variation in the yarns and the colors that you're getting. I like that uh, Swedish yellow, Rhea. I wonder, uh, Melinda, I wonder if it's this one that you, that you mean. They might have used good yarn on that latch hook, which makes it look very nice. Yeah, it, it definitely makes it look different. So all of these kinds of shape shifters that we're talking about tonight, this is so interesting because even within rug hooking, sometimes it's a question of how does it hook or what was it hooked with? Um, same thing with all forms of rug making. We come back to these central questions of what is it and how was it made? And the more we talk and the more we brainstorm, the more we learn, uh, taking our cues tonight from Melinda, who absolutely is the authority, we learn, we're learning a lot in one night. This could be like a college course that you keep coming back for. This is a great example in this rug of getting close-ups where you see a different fiber being used, right? Not just the wool, but you see this thinner, very high gloss, high twist, more of a thread weight, right? More, more like an embro embroidery thread weight, very, very thin, one strand, or possibly two strand, it's twisted, um, being used as part of the knot, as part of the fibers that make up the knot. And then you're seeing other parts that are a bit lush and cushy, right? Interesting. And this is the back of it with the horizontal striping with the good tag on it and a couple of hangers in place. And I think that's just, yeah. I, Melinda says, I love the mix of the various wool weights. Me too. And this said, this is the label on the back of that particular rug by Paulette Serbin, 1972. So I was just a few months old at that point. That's such a nice thought. 
guess what? This is the same rug done by somebody else, also for sale on eBay. I mean, interesting, right? So this is, um, you know, I think I dropped the ball and I didn't, oh no, I did. Um, vintage 1970s Swedish Ria rag rug shag, 1970s NIAB, NIAB rug Scandinavian Nordic psychedelic. Uh, the seller is called King Jerky. 26, 250 free shipping. This is a rare 1970s rear rug made by NIAB in Gothenburg, Sweden. Nordiska Industry AB has become a very collectible rug as these were individually handmade by designers and produced several collectible rugs, the name and date of the designer and manufacturer. So this one has a tag on the back as well. Here's your rare chance to get your hands on one of these very collectible pieces, 17 by 32, absolutely beautiful. Um, same design but slightly different and worked a little bit differently. Has a bit of a different feel, a bit more hazy, a bit more of a watercolor feel. Interesting, isn't it? But it must have come, Melinda, you must know this, it must have come with this label because people were able to fill it out with a pen and sew it to the back. And this one looks washed. Uh, but the rug is still in gorgeous condition. Vintage Rhea rug, shaggy handmade wall hanging, art Scandinavian, Nordic Finland, number two, and the seller is Texcellence, T-E-X, like excellence, but with a, a T in front. Texcellence, um, $125, 12 to ship, good condition, normal signs of wear. Um, this one struck, struck me as very traditional, more like um, very traditional hook drugs that we see and that we make, right? It doesn't have uh, that kind of abstract mid-century modern feel. It, it's much more of a... Um, border driven design the second one has a longer pile than the first one thus the haziness that's a great thing to point out the second one of that same yellow pattern was hazy because it had much longer um, yarn now melinda do you think that means that the maker of the second one had one of those popsicle stick things and it was cut it was that was thick or whatever and was cutting them longer as she went i wonder if you wanted to control the haziness i'm guessing you could make height differences in one piece all on your own but I wonder if they must have gotten the kit because they were both the same color, both of those kits, but one was higher than the other. And I just wonder about that popsicle thing, if that maybe came into play. So for me, I think we're having a problem here again. It's hard to say. Let me see if I can close in a little bit more on this piece. But the problem that's striking me, and I'm sure it's striking you too, is that we've got hemming on four sides. Oh, hi, Cats Gallery. Great to see you. This is a way bigger subject than I thought. I, I was afraid I didn't, as usual, have enough content for tonight. Um, I have way too much content. So this is a to be continued. This doesn't look right to me. Melinda, let me know what you think of the lilac rug with the, with the green border. Um, gosh, it's hard to tell, isn't it? It doesn't look quite right. But what was interesting for me with this one was that there was a companion rug with it that was sold separately. And this is the companion rug. And as you can see, very similar color palette. Um, I thought they went really nice together. And again, the seller is called Texcellence. So the word excellence, but with a T in front. Melinda says, you can choose how long you want to make the pile. A kit might indicate the length and give you the ruler. Oh, I see. Interesting. So when I say popsicle stick, that's, that's my ponytail, I guess. It's like layman's. That is the ruler thing, right? Um, and it comes in different widths. So that would be interesting. Um, let's see. Let's do, this is more of a close-up of that one. And again on the back, whew, these lilac ones have me stumped because that, it seems to me like it can't be re-backing because they have all of the edges hemmed. Uh, Melinda, let me know what you think of these. We can always come back to them. That is a bit puzzling. And this one, another glorious one, Vintage Rhea Danish Rug, circa 1960s, um, 98 by 62 inches, also sold by Mac Decor, M-A-C underscore Decor. I'm not sure about the real looking one with the border all around. Me neither. You know, that, I mean, maybe that's just going to remain a great mystery. But it certainly doesn't look like it has some of the signature things that a um, rear rug should have on its back. Some of the things that we're looking for. So I guess this maybe could be a commercial one. Who knows? Um, but these are like 125 each and 12 to ship. So it's one of those things, if you like it because you like it, then get it because you like it. 
but it is not clear at all on, on those two lilac colored ones whether they are truly handmade Rhea rugs. Vintage Rhea Danish rug circa 1960. So Mac decor, Mac underscore decor. Um, this one, this one is quite fancy. So this one's in Great Britain, and um, in dollars the cost is three thousand seven hundred ninety-four dollars and eighty-one cents, and another one hundred fourteen dollars to ship. Extremely rare and classic vintage Rhea Danish rug, circa nineteen sixties. Condition is very good, no stains, full pile. It's a good clean rug, like it's never been used before really beautiful oh that's my daughter hi joss joss loves pokemon that's my daughter um hey honey so interesting right interesting this is a beautiful design that's a high price tag um melinda says i think it's very hard with materials on hand not a rea backing but a cloth they used as a rea backing and that is fine so that's interesting that you say that because i suppose there are times when for example um if somebody, we do this with rug cooking all the time. Dave, you're always my example for this because you use that dish rag during, dish towel during COVID as your backing because you could not get backing and it worked great. And maybe it's one of these really Yankee ingenuity kind of thrifty instinct things that when you don't have the right backing, you try with the needle on what you've got and it works. And that's a great thought, Melinda, that those two rugs could be examples of someone going, well, it's not the real stuff, it's not the real stuff, but... I have a needle and it works, so I'm going to keep going. So interesting. That is interesting. Oh, Gami says, hi, Ted. Oh, Teddy's on there too. Good Lord. Um, you know, I was thinking about this earlier, stupid joke, but I was thinking about more differences between Latchuk and Rhea uh, rug making. Um, and I was thinking, you know, one of the things that for me, because I have done some Latch, I try to do all kinds of rug making, um, and I love all of it, right? But all of every different form technique has its, has its pros or cons, right? And for me, one of the great cons with latch hook is the pre-cuts. I'm not a huge fan of the pre-cuts. I'm not a huge fan of this vintage tool either that cuts because that works for about five minutes and then um, crafts itself, sorry, but done. Never to be revived. So for me, the pre-cuts are problematic because I travel a lot. And, you know, when I've got like a nest of all these pre-cuts, they all they always mix and get to, no matter what I do, I'm not a big fan of 50 um, Ziplocs either on a ring. I'm not a huge fan of that for myself. But I always end up with this collection of, um, you know, like a nest of latch hook pre-cuts that ends up, you know, falling on the floor and like a tumbleweed, like rolling across the highway in a, in a, in a sandstorm, just like a like a new Pokemon character, Jocelyn. Like this weird, colorful, round thing, a big Pokemon character rolling across the ground. All these little pre-cuts. For me, another great plus to Rhea Rug making over Latch, for me, is not pre-cuts, right? Because I love the yarn. I love touching it. I love the lengths of yarn. I love the ideas that it, it's, it's not these little itty-bitty pieces that turn into a Pokemon and fly away on you. Um, but again, everybody has different pros and cons, different issues. This is a close-up of that very fine, pricey rug that was in the in the high three thousand range, and you know, we all have different budgets and different lifestyles and different priorities. If this is uh, a rug that you are in love with, then it's there for you. It is just beautiful, beautiful pattern. Um, according to what we've learned from Melinda tonight, this looks this looks good to me. This looks like it is hand done, and it looks like it was on one of these. Um, pre-knotted, right, like like ready for you backings. Um, Melinda, let me know if I'm wrong, but that seems consistent with what we've learned thus far. I'm going to go a few more minutes. Desperate times call for desperate measures, right, Dave? Dave, you didn't tell us what you were eating and drinking tonight, and I'm, I'm kind of still waiting. Just kidding. I'm curious. Um, this is another one that I absolutely, absolutely love. Uh, vintage, that's VTG, Rhea Rug Shaggy, um, Kuhn Kivet, K-U-U-N-K-I-V-E-T, Scandinavian, Nordic, Finnish, Finland, also sold by Texcellence again, uh, U.S. Uh, $500 plus 30 shipping, ships from outside the U.S., uh, condition, it, it, skips from, it ships from Scandinavia, this company is in Scandinavia, I forget what, which, which of the countries, uh, condition, good vintage, normal signs of wear. I think this is an extraordinary rug. For me, of, of the ones we've seen tonight that are that are golden oldies, um, in terms of being a mid-century modern, 
this is my favorite one that we're seeing tonight. So you can see close up in this one, I mean, that are not Melinda's, obviously, obviously. This really has the look for me design-wise, and you see the amount of mixing of colors that is happening here. It is really exciting, isn't it? Because if we pull back again, this will probably be the last rug that we cover for tonight because it is getting late and I have so much more content. Um, I just love it, right? I just, don't you love the design? The, the two shapes, like the tw kind of twin shapes that are a bit different, all these slashes of color, kind of lots of color, and then this hazy, shadowy shape through it and underneath it that looks like it's 50% white, 50% bright. And then you're getting that hazy glow. I mean, isn't that something? Oh, Lynn said, Melinda, do you sell their rebacking? I want to try this craft so bad. That's that's just what we want to hear, right? Absolutely. So I'm going to let Melinda answer. There is a thing with um, supplies lately, but I'm going to let her answer because um, I think we all want to get started on our projects. And um, as supplies ease up, and as you know, I make the trip to see Melinda, we'll be checking in and doing updates on what's available um, and how to proceed. So this is not the one-time conversation on Rhea. We are certainly going to be coming back to this on a regular basis because I am super excited to start my project too. Let me show you the rest of the photos of this one, and then we know where we're stopping for tonight. More close-ups. Oh, Dave is having his hot, hard cider with cornbread. You live such a luxurious life. I have got to tell you, when I come to Toronto, uh, it is going to be exhausting for you, like cooking the, your bread and, and finding these nice drinks and taking me on walking tours, right? Isn't that going to be such a hardship? I'm just kidding. I'm going to help you with everything. But we have to go on those walking tours for sure. This is another example of these mixed colors. Just, you know, what we were saying earlier, if you come to a wall and you're like, uh-oh, did I do that? And something's wrong and you want to adapt your pattern as you're working, you can see how you can make shifts. You can make changes. You know, I, I'm not saying that this wasn't sort of um, thought out in advance and, and uh, part of the project, but you could see how you could make shifts with color with this form and be very, very successful and spontaneous. You could see how that would work. Mm. I was just, I, I mean, I used a lot of photos from it because look at these colors. And you can see with your eye um, up at the top, that kind of top right outside of the shape, that looks to me like it's three quarters white and maybe one quarter of the dark. Because you can see there's still the hint. There's a bit of a five o'clock shadow situation happening there. Um, a little bit lighter, but still not solid. Isn't that exciting as a prospect isn't that exciting all of these mixtures of colors on this particular rug I just found this one to be extraordinary here's some more of them here and you know at first I thought is that is that bleed underneath the red where I'm seeing those pinks but then I thought no because if you look to the bottom right where just where the blue meets the white you can see that lilac color repeat so that is not bleed that is an intentional um, blend uh, you know, uh, referring to the red right next to it, they included a little bit of pink in a few places. Mm. Just beautiful. And this is the back of that one. And again, based on what we've learned tonight, it seems like um, this is a Rhea, right? It's hem it, This one is hemmed, so it isn't one of these pre-made ones with the uh, uh, fringe. Um, it looks right. The back looks right. It's hemmed on two sides. I mean, this one is just, uh-oh, let's not do that. Let's save that one for next time. So that one was beautiful. I'll just remind you because we spent significant time on that one. That one was sold by Texcellence. Texcellence, I, I want to say that they're in Finland, um, but you'll find them if you search. And they do sell a lot of rear rugs, and they are all beautiful. Did you see the back of that one, Ryan? Let me show you. Let me show you. I want to do one more. Let me see if I can find it. Boop. Oh, I was pretty close, huh? There we go. Me too, Dave. Me too. I'm making plans for next year already. Um, the year got away from me really fast. Writing that first book, as you know, did me in. Second one's going a lot easier. Um, I have been getting a lot of questions on that first book because... Um, 
it's available for pre-sale on Amazon. If you look at my actual name, I usually go by Ribbon Candy Hooking, um, but my actual name's Diana, spelled like Dina, D-E-A-N-A, David. It's it's a rug, uh, a rag rug book that is available for pre-order on Amazon. We're not sure about the cover still, so they are still doing editing to it and things, but it is available for pre-order, and it's there. But I will tell you more about it when I, fi when, when I find more out about it. But the rug, um, the book I'm working on now, the next book is for Rug Hooking Magazine. The first one was for Fox Chapel, and the second one for Rug Hooking Magazine, and that is the one that's d design like. Um, so I'll be giving you lots of shout outs working on that one too. But yes, that book is available for pre order. And as I know more about it, because we they are still on that end in the editing process, I'll tell you more about it. It's not for sale yet, it is just available as pre order. And hopefully it comes out soon. And we can, well, I don't know if I'll be reviewing my own book. That would be weird. But I'll show you all the pieces that are in it at last, and that would be a lot of fun. But for tonight, I had a lot more content to do, a lot more content. So why don't we say absolutely signed copy? Absolutely. We'll figure out how to get that done. But of course, of course, Karen says, Dave, leftover hot dogs, hamburgers from the grill, roasted vegetables, and bourbon. Oh, I love bourbon and ginger ale. Maker's Mark and ginger ale. That's one of my faves. Melinda, thank you so much for being with us tonight. This has been this has been, I think, for me, the most educational episode that we've done. It's always that viewers are writing things in the comments and I'm learning at the same time, but tonight was really extraordinary. Um, but it's gotta be a to be continued because we are after nine now and I've got a lot more. So for next week on Coffee Time, I'm gonna pick up where we left off with this conversation, looking at a further gallery of rugs um, on Monday's Coffee Time. That, that is at noon Eastern Central Time I need to go to bed, man. You can tell, right? I'm dying. This this is only going so far, this guy. Um, noon Eastern Standard Time uh, on the Ribbon Candy Hooking channel, and I will put the, the link up in our group, which is Facebook Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club in the morning. Um, in the meantime, you can always reach me at ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com. Send me your pieces, your gallery pieces for next Friday. I need those. This coming week, I will run coffee time on Monday, and I will run cocktail time on um, Friday. But I think I'm going to take off in the middle of the week with the kids, summertime. Um, I'm going to leave probably Tuesday. Uh, we're, we want to go to an amusement park in New Hampshire, Canopy Lake, on Wednesday. And um, Thursday, I'll probably be driving back. So I will not run a middle week uh, episode this week just so I'm not rushing them and pushing them. And we can have a nice time, um, me and the kids. So that will be fun. But I will be with you Monday to conclude, well, we'll see how far it goes, the episode on the rear rugs. And then on Friday, we are doing our, our gallery night. And gallery night, if you're joining us for the first time, means that you can send in to ribboncandyhooking at gmail.com pictures of the rugs you're working on, pictures of the rugs you've done, pictures of designs of rugs that are, are still a germ and you're still thinking about them and evolving them, anything you want, any kind of rug, including rear rugs including any kind of rugs. Send them in and I share those on gallery night so we can all see what everybody else is working on and be inspired by each other's work. It doesn't matter what form it is, doesn't matter when you made it, if it's finished. I just like to know what you're doing, what you've done, and it's a great night to share. We try to do this every three weeks. That will be coming up this coming Friday. So send me anything that you want. It can be more than one thing and I will share as many as I can on Friday night, this coming Friday, a week from today, on gallery night. Let me just catch up with the, oh, Lisa, thank you. It was a great time for me too. Daniela, great to see you. Oh, thank you so much. So I will be back with you and we will conclude this great episode on Monday on Coffee Time. Have a wonderful weekend. You know where to find me. I will see you on Monday. Happy.